I'm Ed Perrin, uh, Professor Emeritus in the School of Public Health, uh, retired approximately 10 years ago as Chair of the Department of Health Services. I started out, I was, I was born in the state of Vermont and started out uh, in a small town there, as a matter of fact. Graduated from a high school in which there were 16 kids in the graduating class. So I have always referred to myself as a country boy. Uh, went from Plainfield, Vermont, which was my hometown, to Middlebury College in, in Vermont and graduated from there in 1953. Uh, I was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship. Incidentally, I should say that my major in, at Middlebury was, was not French or Spanish or a language as it was for most of Middlebury uh, students in those days. It was mathematics. And I was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship uh, from there to the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, where I attended 1953-1954, and uh, came back from Scotland from my Fulbright uh, to the University of Columbia, Columbia University in, in New York, where I uh, studied for my master's degree. Um, while a student at Columbia, um, I, I had a visiting uh, professor from Stanford who came up to me after class one day and said, you know, would you like, uh, would, did you like graduate school? And I said, I did. And he said, how would you like to come out to Stanford? And I, I to tell you the truth, I thought Stanford was somewhere down near Hartford or New Haven in Connecticut <laughs> in those days, but I quickly learned that uh, Stanford was in fact a, a fine institution on the West Coast. So indeed, I accepted the invitation to come out to Stanford. And at that time, Carol and I were um, planning to get married, so we did get married, and we came out, drove across the country to Stanford University, uh, where uh, she became an undergraduate student, and I finished my Ph.D. at Stanford in, about, in 1960. Um, my major there was in statistics. I, in fact, it was especially within uh, statistics, biostatistics. I was the first graduate student in biostatistics to graduate from Stanford University. That was in 1960. Um, the reason I, I chose statistics and biostatistics was, first of all, why, did I, why was I in mathematics? Well, I, I was doing mathematics because I thought it was fun. I found it relatively easy, and I enjoyed it. And I... I when I thought of ways to make a living as a mathematician, they were, they were fairly limited. One of the things I did was to go to Hartford, Connecticut as an actuary student, an actuarial student, um, to see if indeed I would like to, to become an actuary. And while there, I, I decided that the only way I could really be a mathematician would be to work with people. And the way to work with people was to go into a, a, a discipline that involved people and in this case, it was uh, medicine and public health. So I became a biostatistician. About the only good thing that really that came out of that, my, my visit to Hartford that summer and uh, as a student at Traveler's Insurance was that I met Carol there, and we got married, and we're still married 51 years later. So that was a good summer for that, for that purpose. Um, so at any rate, I graduated from Stanford in statistics, in biostatistics, uh, in 1960, and my first job at that point, I decided that there were one of three school schools I would like to uh, to become a faculty member, and uh, at which I would like to become a faculty member. And they were, let's see, La Jolla, uh, University of California at La Jolla, uh, University of Colorado in, in Boulder, or the University of Washington in Seattle. Unfortunately, none of those three were interested in me at that point, so uh, I accepted a position at the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, we moved to Pittsburgh in, in 19, the fall of, let's see, this, I guess it was the summer of 1960. Um, I spent two years there, a total of three actually, uh, and at the end of my second year, I, w I was at a conference in North Carolina when I met this tall, gangly fellow uh, who was a, a, a professor at the University of Washington. I happened to be on the bus with him, and he asked me where I was from, 
And I told him, and I said, gosh, you know, I always wanted to come to Seattle to be uh, on the faculty at the University of Washington. And he said, well, what do you do? And I told him, his name was Doug Chapman, and he was a professor of mathematics at, the, at that time, and we were at a conference for biomathematicians. He came back uh, to Seattle, and about a month later I got a call from chairman of the Department of Preventive Medicine, uh, Tom Grayston, to come out for an interview. Uh, and that was in the, uh, let's see, the spring of 1962. I came out for my interview the day the World's Fair opened in, 19, in, the, in the spring of 1962. That um, was a big, a big day. Uh, and I liked what I saw, and, I was in, and so Carol and I came out to Seattle in the fall of, of 1962, and I joined the Department of Preventive Medicine. Now, when um, when I came, the department was relatively small. Tom, there was Tom Grayston, the chair. Uh, Russ Alexander was uh, in the department, an epidemiologist, uh, infectious disease epidemiologist. George Kenny had had just arrived. Um, there was a statistician, uh, Blair Bennett, on the faculty. Jack Hatlin was here, uh, and a number of uh, three or four people who had been associated with public health uh, in the in the Department of Public Health at the uh, King County and and uh, and also some one or two people associated with the um, kinesiology department in the in the uh, university. So it was a the the medical school itself probably wasn't much more than ten or twelve years old at that time, and the Department of Pre- Preventive Medicine had just been created, um, and Tom Grayston made the, um, the chair. Tom, in those days, had a very active research program going with the Naval Medical Research Unit in Taiwan in uh, trachoma research, and many of us became involved in that quite rapidly. Um, when I came, one of the very first things that happened was that I became responsible for teaching uh, biostatistics to medical students, which under the best of circumstances is a, is a difficult, difficult task, especially in the first two years of, of medical school. So very quickly I convinced the people in the medical school that it was much better that I have the postdocs to teach them research design and statistics than to teach them as undergraduates, and that's eventually how it worked out. Uh, after the first year or so, Blair Bennett, who was the other statistician who was already uh, on the faculty, left and went to the University of Hawaii. And uh, Tom Grayston gave me the opportunity to to grow the the unit, and um, he was always very good about that. A marvelous uh, chair and uh, very supportive. One of the highlights of my uh, experience at the University of Pittsburgh was that I worked with a a, uh, a young man, actually older than I, but uh, close to my age, Donovan Thompson, who was an absolute delight to work with and was, in fact, my mentor to a large degree, and just having come out of graduate school. So when uh, Tom gave me the opportunity to add a statistician to the faculty, the first thing I did was try to recruit Donovan Thompson and was successful, and Donovan came out I don't know the exact year. It was probably 1964, something like that, and um, joined the faculty, and he and I formed the nucleus of the biostatistics unit within the Department of Preventive Medicine. And he later uh, became chair of the department after I uh, left and went to Washington, which I'll describe later. Uh, a marvelous, marvelous man, a very, very good friend of mine. Donovan Thompson was a was a very special person. He... <coughs> He was um, from Minnesota and quite proud of his Minnesota background. In fact, I think he went to uh, one of the smaller schools, St. Olaf, possibly, in Minnesota, and uh, <clears throat> had been a Marine, in fact, an adjutant to a general in the, in the Second World War. Uh, and uh, he likes to tell stories how his primary job was to carry the whiskey for the general. Uh, 
over in the islands and, and the Pacific. He loved to. He was a, a vet. He came came out in that in that time from uh, the Second World War and came back to graduate school um, at Iowa State University, I believe, and was a student of Oscar Kempthorn, who was a famous um, statistician um, and a fellow. As a matter of fact. He was a very good mathematician, Donovan Thompson was. And there is a, a formula which is not well known uh, to these days because it's not used much, but it's, it's, it's called the Thompson-Horowitz uh, formula. Uh, and uh, he, he developed it with a fellow graduate student, Dan Horowitz. It, it was a method of sampling, uh, and if you look in a, sam- in a sampling text, you'll find the Thomson Horvitz uh, sampling method there, which he developed with his uh, with Dan uh, Horvitz as a graduate student from Iowa uh, State. He uh, his first job was at the University of Pittsburgh in the School of Public Health in the Department of Biostatistics. And when I arrived there in 19. 19- 60, he was second in command, basically. The, uh, Tony Chaco was the chair. He'd come in from the department of HEW, from a federal department, and, and Donovan was the real academic in the group. Very personable, friendly, uh, a wonderful wife, Georgia, uh, who, in fact, is ter- became one of my wife's best friends. Um, he was very well liked by the students. This was in Pittsburgh where I was making these observations, and, and, he, and he was a great mentor to me, uh, just a thoroughly enjoyable, but, but more than enjoyable. He had a lot of common sense. And, and amongst statisticians, that's not always a, a universal trait. Um, he, he, in fact, didn't get hung up on formulas and and crunching numbers, uh, he was a great one for asking the question, you know, what do you really want to know, and doesn't it look like this, and doesn't it look like that? It was a very, and and that made him very easy to talk to uh, f- for people outside of the profession, physicians who were not statisticians, people who in, in the medical uh, field who needed help with their data could talk with Donovan because he was a very sensible, down-to-earth bright person and um, so when I had the opportunity to hire uh, someone to join our faculty it was a little unusual here in in Seattle a little unusual in the sense that Donovan was senior to me but that didn't bother him he he came out he liked it he liked what he saw he liked the the area he liked uh, thought he would like living here and, and indeed he did. Uh, he came out for the interview and bought a house. And that, you know, that, that was it. He bought a house and he, and he called up Georgia and he says, we're, we're moving to Seattle and I've got a house. And so, uh, and he was a tremendous help uh, in, this, in the School of, of Public Health when he arrived, not just in statistics, but I mean, he served, during his career, he served as the acting chair of the Department of Environmental Health, the acting dean of the School of Public Health, uh, and, 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 and many other roles. I mean, he was that kind of person. He could, he's, he could do these things. He could fit in and, and be productive um, wherever he was. As I say, he, he's a good teacher, excellent teacher, and well-liked by the students, and, but also an excellent consulting statistician. So that um, now I, I will say that he there's another important thing about Donovan that well, first of all let me say that that he um, he was a golfer mm-hmm. loved to play golf and he when he arrived uh, I took up golf again so I could play golf with him and um, uh, Dick Cronmall when he came played golf. We used to make up a foursome and go out 
and uh, once a week in those days in, in the afternoon and play golf because uh, Donovan was really really a golfer. As a matter of fact, he died on the golf course, which uh, his wife Georgia said is exactly the way he he would have wanted it. He he had his final heart attack when he was <clears throat> playing on the sec- I think it was the second hole at, at, at Sand Point. Um, the one thing that bef- much of what Donovan did in the School of Public Health was was after he took over for me, uh, the, the chair of the department, and I left to go to Washington. But he also did a great deal before that. In particular, there was a, a group, um, the, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center was being established. Uh, um, and, and I forget, the, not Fred, but the, the Hutchinson, Dr. Hutchinson, who was, was working with Senator Magnuson to establish this place, uh, talked to us about the relationship between the university and the Fred Hutch. And um, I assigned that responsibility to Donovan Thompson. And Donovan, in fact, laid the groundwork for the relationship between the School of Public Health and the Fred Hutchinson Research uh, Center, which during the the, la- the late 60s uh, and early 70s, and in fact was the the the, the major architect of uh, of that relationship which, which exists today, in which I, I will point out did not occur in the School of Medicine, which is unfortunate, but we were able to do it because Donovan had the personality and the and the uh, the drive and the know how to do that, and and so he was successful in establishing that relationship with the Hutch um, at the very beginning, and, and it main, it's, as I say, it's been maintained to this day. But that's just an example of the sort of thing that, that he did routinely. Uh, a wonderful fellow. Um, and, and as I say, it was a great comfort to me to know that he was here and could be the chair of the department uh, when, I, when I left. Um, during that time, uh, the school was was growing very rapidly. It was a wonderful, very go-go time in in uh, the, in Seattle at the University of Washington in the '60s, and and growth was sort of the order of the day, and 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 also there was a, a real entrepreneurial spirit in in the university, which we benefited from tremendously. There were two events which occurred in that period between 1962 and 1970 when we were a Department of Preventive Medicine that stand out in my mind. The first of these was the development of the of my relationship with Doug Chapman, whom I'd met on the, the bus in North Carolina and who had helped to recruit me to the University of Washington. When I arrived, there was no Department of Statistics on campus. There was no Department of Computer Sciences no Department of Applied Mathematics, and certainly no Department of Biostatistics. There was only a Department of Mathematics. Uh, And in that department, there were three or four very good statisticians, uh, Doug Chapman being one of them, Z.W. Birnbaum being another, Ron Pike uh, a third. Um, But they were a subunit within the Department of Mathematics. And I knew that if we were going to grow my discipline within the biomedical sciences that we needed somehow to have a liaison with the Department of Mathematics um, and to uh, to put together the resources of the Department of Mathematics in my de- in in my little unit in in preventive medicine and indeed in those days um, the university had a a uh, an administrative model which could be used for that purpose. It was called a group. Uh, one could form a group within the university which was not a department but could be made up of faculty from various departments around the university that could in fact apply for a degree and award that degree as a group as opposed to as a specific department. And Doug Chapman and I created the, the, uh, the biomathematics group in the mid-60s. Doug was the first chair, and I succeeded him two or three years later as the chair, in which 
it was the first effort on our campus to have an applied mathematics activity outside of the Department of Mathematics, and it was quite a, uh, really quite a step forward. We, in addition to involving the, the statisticians in the Department of Preventive Medicine, we also involved the uh, people in forestry and fisheries um, and the other uh, sciences um, on lower campus. So um, that was really the, uh, the first... Oh, and I should say that as a result of forming that group, we were able to get uh, from the federal government, from the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, a training grant, the first training grant in biostatistics at the University of Washington in the mid-60s, which uh, supported uh, four or five students, one of whom is now the dean of the School of Public Health, <laughs> incidentally, um, uh, and 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 supported in those days supported faculty as well. So we were able to grow our faculty, and we indeed we did grow it. Uh, Dick Cronmall came from UCLA. Um, um, Norm Breslow joined us in the late '60s from from Stanford. Uh, Paula, Paula Deer uh, came to us from UCLA as well. Polly Feigl. These were all. Uh, people that joined our faculty in the late 60s. That, that's why I say it was a growth period. It was a tremendous growth period for, for us in biostatistics and, and in the other disciplines and in Department of Preventive Medicine. The other thing which occurred during the uh, 60s, which was significant to me, was that there was a competition uh, amongst the departments of preventive medicine around the country or something that was sponsored by the Millbank Memorial Fund. Um, they put out a, a, uh, an, a call for applications for fellowships. Uh, and again, with the support of my chair, uh, Tom Grayston, who is, as I said, was very, very supportive, uh, I, I applied for that and was awarded a Millbank Faculty Fellowship in Preventive Medicine in the, about 1964. And the significant part of that is that there were only five awarded in the country, but the other four were all physicians. And since I'm not a physician, this was a, for me, it was a, a, a significant way to become involved in the, uh, um, the young uh, medical fraternity in the country. And um, that was a very important growth period. Um, we we met in various um, and studied the healthcare systems throughout the country, but also spent a great deal of time in, in Latin America. In uh, because, in fact, along with the five fellows from the U.S., there were five Latin American fellows who were uh, chosen, and we used to meet regularly in places like Viña de Mar, Chile, and and uh, places like that, and uh, in Buenos Aires. And um, so we learned a great deal about the healthcare delivery systems in Latin America as well. And I was I was the only non-physician in the group, and as such, played a very special role. And it was a very uh, special learning experience for me. As a sidelight to that, I will say that toward the end of that period, they allowed us to have junior fellows of our own in our own institution, and uh, I was fortunate enough to to convince, uh, be able to convince Betty Gilson, who was at that time um, in in the department, uh, to be a, a, junior, a junior faculty fellow, and she also joined me um, in, in that enterprise, and that was a, useful to her, I think, as, as it was to me. Now, that period from 1962 to 1970 is significant because it was, we were members of the faculty, uh, members of the faculty of the School of Medicine at that time. And I, I, at this point, I want to say that, that, uh, that for me, as a non-physician, that was really a, a, wonderful, a wonderful growth experience. I came in as an assistant professor in 1962, and I, got, I was promoted to an associate professor and a full professor with tenure in the School of Medicine by, the time, by 1968 or 69. So that um, um, so that 
you'd have to say that we were very well accepted in the School of Medicine and that, as a matter of fact, by 1968, I was on the admissions committee of the School of Medicine and in 1969 was the uh, name the chair of the, sci- the medical scientist pathway, which is the MD-PhD pathway in the School of Medicine. Uh, and, I, and I say that because the next thing which I want to talk about is the fact that in 1970, the Department of Preventive Medicine became a school of public health. Um, and that uh, decision, although it, on the surface, it, it was a unanimous decision of the, I guess I should back up and say that by that time there were five divisions that had been created within the, within the department. The, the current, the ones that are currently departments. Those divisions, of course, were biostatistics, epidemiology, environmental health, pathobiology, and health services. And those of us who were heads of those dis, uh, divisions, along with Tom Grayson, formed the sort of the, the nucleus of the executive committee of the department. And when the opportunity came up for us to become a school, we discussed it extensively and unanimously decided that that was the appropriate action to take. But I think I should emphasize that in doing that, some of us gave up a fair amount, a good deal, actually. It was the right decision, and has proven to be, because we have become, in fact, one of the major players in the public health in the country, one of the major schools, uh, and, um, and it has been the right thing to do. But, but I think it's... It, also important to understand that in so doing, we gave up an important relationship, which has been very hard to, to uh, maintain. In fact, we have not maintained as well as I would have hoped uh, in the ensuing years. Now, the arguments for becoming a school uh, were good ones. They were, one, financial. That is, if we became a school of public health, we would get a stipend from the federal government for every student we had. Now, I forget what that stipend was, but it was significant. I mean, so that the annual amount that we got each year was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it was a significant amount of money for the department. That was the first argument. The second argument was that if we're going to have behavioral and social scientists, uh, non-physicians on our faculty, it was going to be very, very hard to get... um, to, for them to become hired, uh, to get promoted, to be respected, and, and get recognition in the School of Medicine. And that's probably true, in fact, although I like to think that I did very reasonably well with, without a medical degree, but I think it's probably true that in general um, it, it would have been difficult to maintain a large staff of social scientists in the medical schools. So it was, it was the... Um, the right decision to make, but it was the hardest probably for my department, the Department of Biostatistics and some of the junior faculty in it, I think we're not terribly happy about the the move. And the reason is pretty obvious, and that is biostatistics is the discipline which does not necessarily relate to public health. I mean, in fact, it relates probably most closely to medicine, uh, because in those days we were developing uh, methods for the analysis of clinical trials survival analysis was was the hot new topic and we were and we were um, providing leadership in that area and so forth many of us were working uh, uh, with the clinicians uh, and 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 I've already said that how I was involved in the, in the curriculum and so on and so forth so for many of us it was a difficult split the idea, of course, was that we would, even though we were a school of public health, we would, be, in fact, be the Department of Preventive Medicine in the School of Medicine. But, of course, it never works out that way quite. In fact, um, there, has, there has been something of a distance created uh, between public health and medicine over time, uh, which is, and that distance really depends a lot deal, a lot on the personalities of deans involved and so on and so forth. But um, we, ha- we do have a close relationship with medicine, it, but it's not the same as though we were uh, part, part of that school. So, ho- However, I, I, I did want to point out that 
despite the fact that it was a, a smooth operation and we've done very well since then, it was not necessarily an open and shut case. I mean, it was, as I think I told someone recently, it was a, a question of do you want to be a, a a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond? And, and that may be an oversimplification of it, but... Um, that was kind of the decision we made. And I, as I say, I think it was the right decision, even though some of us gave, gave up something in the process. Well, we became a school in 1970, and I became chairman of the Department of Biostatistics. And the other division heads became chairman of their departments. Um, then in, uh, let's see, um, I guess... I, I have not. I, I think I've mentioned most of the faculty who came in at about that time. Uh, in, in the late, in the early um, '70s, I was visited by um, someone who worked for the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in Washington D.C. and interviewed, and was offered the job of as the director of the National Center for Health Statistics. Uh, now that's an agent, the agency which is responsible for the National Health Interview Survey, the Vital Statistics System, um, and um, in, in general, gathering and assembling the health data of the country and publishing it. Um, that was in 1972. I was offered that position, and at that point, I'd been in my position for ten years, and I thought, well, you know, I'm. I've been an academic, why don't I go out in the real world? Well, of course, I've since learned that Washington is not the real world. <laughs> but I was young in those days. <laughs> and so, I, and besides that, you know, we had been through transitions, and I had been uh, the head of the unit for almost 10 years, and it seemed like a good time for, for uh, to let the next generation step in. And, of course, Donovan Thompson was there as my colleague and was the obvious choice to succeed me, and did, and did a marvelous, marvelous job of, uh, as my successor. So off I go to Washington, D.C. in 1972. We arrive, Carol and I and our two children, uh, Jennifer and Scott, and we arrived in Washington and get uh, in September of 72. Now, for those of us who are old enough to remember, that was the fall in which Richard Nixon was elected to second term, and there was something that grew out of that that time from September through uh, the election, which is called Watergate. So I arrived basically uh, to take over this federal agency about at just about the time Watergate was breaking, was happening, and it broke about about two months later. And uh, I spent so we spent three years in Washington. Uh, watching the 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 executive branch sort of go downhill uh, from inattention and and all of the, the the agony that went with it. I started out working. Um, actually, Casper Weinberger was my secretary of, of HEW, and um, I had I've had a there. I have some interesting stories I could tell about that in, in a different venue. But uh, Nixon finally resigned. Uh, Ford uh, took over as president, and about that time I decided that that really wasn't how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. <laughs> and my my family was uh, was ready to come come back. So after those three years of Watergate and and what have you, um, in which which were you know. Um, Part of an important part of my development, actually. During that time, I became a, I was elected a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, which had a profound effect on the rest of my life, because professional life, because it immediately thrust me into the role of advisor to the government, as actually the main statistical biostatistical advisor to the government for for many years, and I continue that to this day. In fact, I I still serve on the, the committee which does the final review of all National Academy of Sciences uh, publications uh, and um, am the, the, you know, the only statistician on the committee, and, and that's my job, basically. So, but 
I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so in 75, uh, we came back to Seattle, and I came back to the Battelle Memorial Institute, the Human Affairs Research Centers, and Battelle Memorial Institute, which are located, the campus of which is located um, at the foot of the hill in Laurelhurst on, uh, on 41st Street. Um, and um, as a scientist in the Health and Population Study Center, that's now the Human Affairs Research Center were uh, Battelle or a not-for-profit research organization that were doing research, mainly government-sponsored, in in the human affairs area. And health and population was my. Uh, I became the head of that within six months or so, and then uh, ran that for about five years. Incidentally, as during that time, when I was the head of that um, health and population study center. Uh, we spun off a not-for-profit organization called um, the Program in an Ad Adaptation of Technology in Health, PATH, uh, which at that time was a small group uh, doing um, research, but today has become quite prominent for the role that it plays in the um, and the and the um, Gates Foundation, uh, it, it is a a primary um, research and development unit for the Gates Foundation. That's a spinoff of the group which I headed at, at Battelle back in the in the late seventies. Um, so while at Battelle, I I um, I did research, wrote papers, and so forth, as as uh, uh, had done in academic life and so forth. Then in nineteen 80, 81, uh, the position of uh, the chair of the Department of Health Services in the School of Public Health became uh, open. Um, Betty Gilson was at that, that, that time the acting chair, um, and I was appointed to that position. So I came back to the School of Public Health uh, in a role as chair of a second department, the Department of Health Services. Bob Day had been originally the chair of that department uh, and had gone to the hutch, I think, in the meantime, and, and Betty had, had taken over to run the department. So I came, uh, that's, there was, in fact, an interim, an interim chair, and, and that's kind of an interesting story also, um, whose name suddenly... I forget. Uh, he last. He was about two years, and then left, and then Betty Gilson took over. That was it, and I, I followed Betty Gilson. Um, so for me, that was a. It was an opportunity to come back to the School of Public Health to become involved in, um, in the school once again, and I, I welcomed the opportunity, uh, especially to develop the research arm of the Department of, of Health Services, which at that time. Uh, was relatively small, and we did succeed. Of course, that was the one thing I could bring to the department was my uh, experience in research and uh, grant writing and so forth, and we were able to develop the research side of the department quite extensively. Also, so I remain, I was chair of the Department of Health Services from 1981 to probably about 1993, 94, in that area. Um, and uh, during that time, uh, in, the, in the Department of Health Services, we, uh, we, attempt, we basically built up the social science uh, component of the school, uh, which, had, which is housed in the Department of, of Health Services, uh, by, in particular, bringing on Donald Patrick, who was a senior person in that area, um, and um, also, even though I'm a mathematician, I I could see that the the role of the public health scientist per se was probably hadn't been emphasized enough in the school, and so we in in those years uh, attempted to develop a public health science. Uh, part of the curriculum, which has since grown extent, uh, and, and become very, very important part of the department. So, 
I served as chair until uh, the mid the mid nineties with a one year sabbatical in there when I went to Cambridge as a fellow at uh, Churchill College, which was a, um, a very good experience. I came back and then I um, I was succeeded by Bill Dowling in in a in the mid nineties, ninety four, ninety five, and 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 then retired. I and I think it was nineteen, maybe it was nineteen ninety eight. I retired, so I've been retired about eight years now. Now during all that um, time, I've been very active nationally, and as I indicated, um, I I have chaired and written probably about seven or eight reports from the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and have been a ex- reviewer extensively of, of their reports and still am because I'm on the, the final review committee that they have. So uh, and I've served on a number of advisory committees and I, as pres- national, president of the National Health Services uh, Research Organization and so on and so forth. So I've, uh, I've kept busy. Uh, even though I'm retired, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just this last week I've gotten back from revisiting a place where Carol and I and the family went on sabbatical to to help establish a new medical school down in Buenos Aires. That was uh, in the 60s as a Milbank fellow. That was my first visit, and we've we've been back since then to... to, um, see how things are going, and, and my most recent visit was just this last uh, two weeks. Well, in terms of the of the deans of the schools of public health, uh, each has had a different personality and has had it, and has, during their tenure, the school has taken on some of that personality. I mean, I think you can see it from the beginning. The first dean, of course, was uh, Tom Grayston. Now, Tom is... is uh, uh, infectious disease, epidemiologist, internal medicine, and the emphasis in the early years of the school, quite understandably, was an infectious disease, and, and they have an, an international reputation was developed in those years, and since then, um, and infectious disease, disease epidemiology was sort of the driving force in the school uh, for the first uh, five to ten years. And as I say, I, I wasn't there all of this time, but of course I was observing, so I could, I could see. Now, Bob Day became dean. Bob was uh, had been the chairman of the Department of Health Services, and um, tended to be more of a healthcare systems delivery person. His his interest was in the delivery of healthcare and how it was organized, and and. Um, so it, it it brought uh, of course he, he is a physician also and um but the emphasis became slightly different during his deanship now i wasn't there uh during that time very long but it was a a time of of the growth of the other departments and so forth then gill came gill Oman came from from washington where he had been second in command at the Office of Management and Budget, with all of the trappings that goes with that position, uh, and uh, he was the dean when I went back as a, to Department of Health Services as chair. And his his style, of course, was quite different. I mean, he I'll never forget one of the first meetings I went to. Uh, he he suggested that we all write some sort of a paper. And we have it on his desk by tomorrow morning at eight o'clock or something like that. You know, it was it was the the whole the whole uh, atmosphere sort of changed because Washington had arrived, and uh, um, it was so there was a a, a learning curve, uh, shall we say, for for those of us who were chairs, and and possibly also for Dean Oman. Uh, so, but we worked our way through that, and and he he was a very he's a human genet is a human geneticist, uh, very bright, very very active, very um, uh, energetic, successful, and and he brought 
that sort of energy to the school and uh, the, the, the striving for excellence, which marked uh, uh, those years. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see, where... Uh, that it's. I'm not sure when Pat became the dean. I, th I think it was after I retired, as a matter of fact. But of course, I know Pat because Pat, Doc Dean Wall, I guess should call her, uh, was a student in our program in the uh, in the late uh, '60s, and um, uh, one of one of our very best students, and then later a faculty member, of course, and an excellent teacher. Very, very uh, good in, in relating to people, understanding issues. Um, she has the she has done an excellent job in in relating to the school of medicine, which might seem unusual in that she is the first non physician to be dean of the school, and yet I would have to say that she's probably done as well, if not better, than, than the rest in bringing together the School of Medicine and the, uh, um, and the School of Public Health. I'll, although I, my observations are, are imperfect because I haven't been there the whole time, but she's done a, I think the creation of the Department of um, uh, Global Health is a, is a perfect example of the kind of thing that, that Pat can do. I mean, she's... she's She's a true academic. She's very bright. She gets along uh, well with people, and and there's not nothing there's nothing that she isn't willing to try and to work out. And I think I wouldn't personally have bet that working out the arrangements to have a department jointly between between medicine and public health would have been at all easy. As a matter of fact, from my experience, it would have been very, I would have thought it very very difficult. But they seem to have done it. And I think Pat deserves a great deal of credit for that. And she's, uh, um, I think she's she's a, the right dean for the right time. Bill Richardson and I uh, have been colleagues for many, many years. Um, Bill was, of course, in the Department of Health Services when I was in biostatistics. Um, but we've uh, actually, our careers have, have inter interceded in many there have been intersections, I guess, of our career in many careers, many different ways. Uh, for example, when I was um, the director of the National Center for Health Statistics, um, Bill Richardson was head of chairman of the Department of Health Services, I believe, uh, at that time. He came to Washington. He was offered the directorship of the agency, which was my sister agency in Washington, the National Center for Health Services Research. And I remember spending a snowy day in Washington with Bill. I'd been there only two years, talking about the ins and outs of being in the federal government and the pluses and minuses of academic life versus running a federal agency. And he decided... Uh, I don't know whether it was a result of my conversation with him or not, but he decided to stay in academia and uh, as the chair of the Department of uh, Health Services. And uh, he, uh, of course, is very successful going on to become president of uh, Johns Hopkins. Well, no, it was at Johns Hopkins. Yes, Johns Hopkins University. And then the, Kell the foundation, the Kellogg Foundation, and he's been a member with me of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, and we meet frequently. And, and I was on the, some of his uh, boards at uh, the foundation and so forth. So um, I didn't have that much really to do. I know he was, early on in his career, he, um, he did a very important uh, study of, uh, of the health care system, the insurance um, I did a study of the effect of insurance on health care in the Seattle area, which was, which was uh, fairly groundbreaking and, and really very important for, for the, in the Department of Health Services. But my associations with Bill were primarily outside of the school from then on. There is one, one person that I did not mention. Uh, 
And it's because he uh, was here for only for a couple of years. The first, the 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 first division head of env- the division of environmental health. Um, Jim McCarroll uh, came in the mid '60s, but he he replaced a, a Martin, um, yes. Harry Martin. Is yes. That that was I was trying to recall his name, and it, and um, I didn't mention him. But Harry Martin was here in in the early days as well, um, and later to be replaced by Jim McCarroll. Um, well, I think we pretty much covered the notes that I had. Well, then that gives us time for a Casper Weinberger story or two. <laughs> well, okay. It's, um, well, I, I'll tell you a couple of stories uh, about being in Washington in, from 72 to 75, right after I left as here as the chair of Biostat. The first one was I, um, I was responsible for the budget of my agency, which in those days was not huge. It was maybe forty, fifty million dollars, and um, but I had to go down to the o- OMB, Office of Management and Budget, to defend that budget to the budget examiners. So I trundled down one day, and I'm sitting here, actually arguing with the budget examiner about the contents of the National Health Survey. And, and interestingly enough, and I'll, this is the truth, so I'll, I'll tell you what we were arguing about. It was a young woman who just graduated from from college, and one of the questions we asked on the National Health Interview Survey was, when was your last period? And this young woman was telling me, there's no way people are going to remember when, when their last period was. And I thought, you know, I thought, you know, <laughs> uh, what do I know about this? All I know is what they tell me. It's over. But anyway, at that point, somebody stuck their head in the, in the door at, the, at OMB and said, quick, you've got to get over to the White House. The president's coming back. And I said, okay, you guys go. I'll sit here. I'll be here when you come back. No, 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 you've got to go, too. We need everybody we can. So we, we go down the, uh, down the hall, run down the stairs, through the tunnel, and pop up and into the Rose Garden, believe it or not, in the White House. And it was the day that Richard Nixon was coming back from, uh, from Asia, and he was in a lot of trouble, and uh, that his helicopter was coming in, and they lined us all up. All of us, all of us office workers were lined up there, along with the cabinet. I stood next to the Secretary of the Treasury, actually, and and they had uh, down in front. They had the children of all the cabinet members, and Nixon arrived. He got off the the helicopter and waved, and we waved back at him, and so forth. And then, of course, on the TV that night, it was crowd welcomes the president back from Asia. <laughs> <laughs> I had been in my first my first photo op, <laughs> and, and uh, let's see. The second thing that I could relate has to do with sitting in a meeting with Casper Weinberger um, during those those days that the Watergate story was breaking, and um, it was a, a fairly large group around a table. And he was running the meeting, and midway through the meeting, there was a knock on the door. Somebody came in and hand, handed Secretary Weinberger a note. Wein, Secretary Weinberger sort of got very red in the face and looked at the, the messenger, handed back the note, and said, you tell the president if he wants me to do that, he's going to have to sign it himself. And off he went. So apparently... The underlings were trying to maneuver some things, and Weinberger was was saying, "Okay, but I'll do it only if the president wants me to," and so forth. I never, we never did learn what it was all about, but uh, it was just part of the intrigue that sure. it was going on in those days, and still does, for that matter. Yeah. Okay, this this is a photograph taken of the of the faculty and fellows in the Department of Preventive Medicine, and I, I think the year must have been about 1964, something like that, um, perhaps a little later. Uh, but we have uh, Tom Grayston, the chair, and... Uh, Where's Tom again? Pardon? Where's Two Point Tom out again? 
<laughs> That's Tom. That's Bob Day. George Kenny. Jim McCarroll, who was head of environmental health. Um, and, of course, that that's... I, was, I wouldn't let you find me, but there I am. horn rim glasses and all. And here's Donovan. Donovan Thompson. Which one was Donovan? Yeah. That's Donovan. Um, Norm Breslow, who later was chair of the Department of, of uh, Biostatistics. And uh, I didn't mention the fact that there were three... Postdoc fellows, I'm sure Tom mentioned this in, in when he talked, who were very instrumental in in the research in the department, and that was uh, Irv Emanuel, um, Palmer Beasley, and uh, Ted Dagey. Do I see Ted Dagey there anywhere? There's Jack Hatlin. Um, uh, I don't see Ted Dagey. He, he must have been over in Taiwan. Yeah, at the we time. had a great interview with her. Yeah, yeah, yeah he I really bet. enjoyed it too. Yeah. Uh, but this, that's the uh, the group in the mid mid sixties.